So I gave you a fairly lengthy pre-writing assignment. Who's actually finished with it? Nobody? Who's got it halfway done? A quarter of the class. It's not intended for you actually to be able to finish it in the time <coughs> that I gave you. And <clears throat> why would I do something like that that would frustrate you at the very beginning of class? What does it have to do with close readings? You'll see in just a, just a few minutes. You had four different activities. One was to think about something that you actually you know, could recall, could remember, could put down on the page. And then I had so, some more structured stuff to dig into it deeper. Um, it takes time to do that sort of thing well. And I'm going to provide you with more of those in iLearn so that you can use those as a sort of a template if you want to. There's many different ways to do this kind of activity of close reading. So this is the beginning of the actual workshop. Um, we're going to look at close readings as a type of writing. So you might say, that's a little weird. Why are they called close readings if it's really a kind of writing? Well, because with close readings, um, reading and writing are going hand in hand. It's a, what we call an iterative process, meaning that it's done in many steps. It's not something that you just sit down and, and do once. So the first thing that I want to do is, um, before we even talk about what a close reading is, talk about why we're doing this workshop. So how many of you did anything that was called a close reading back in high school? A few of you? OK. Did you do them in English classes, literature classes? Yeah, English, sometimes history. Yeah, that's, that's probably where you would see them. Now, close reading is a technique that is used in literature and in history and in theater and a few other fields, religious studies, um, because it focuses on a text. Right? A close reading <coughs> is always of a text, generally by a particular thinker. It's not something that we teach students how to do for the most part in middle school, high school, what you're studying in college, English may not even introduce you to this. And when we're doing it in philosophy, there's a somewhat different emphasis. So I'm focusing on how to do close readings in, in philosophy. We're not looking at things like plot or theme quite so much as we are at, say, argument or distinctions or core ideas, those sorts of things. So in the past, I used to just assign these to students. I, I've been assigning close reading papers since I began teaching. And at the beginning, I would just say, well, write me a close reading paper. And how do, how do you think the students did on that? How would you do? If I just said, just write me a close reading paper. I said, well, what's that? You know, look at the text, figure out what's going on in the text, tell me about it. How well, how well equipped do <coughs> you feel for that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I, legitimately so, I think, right? Because that could mean a lot of different things. Maybe you tell me about the text and the way that you learned to in your high school lit class, and turns out I'm not looking for that sort of thing at all. When I cover it with red ink, oh, you screwed up, you know? But it's not fair to charge students with screwing up if we don't actually give them the, the tools and the guidance they need to actually succeed. So if I'm going to assign close reading papers to you and say that this is something you ought to do, you know, as an assignment in my class, it's really up to me to make it clear to you what is a close reading paper and how do you go about doing it. So, you know, I've created an assignment sheet for you, I've created uh, a rubric for you, but even that isn't, isn't quite enough, I've found. Students need some sort of uh, introduction to it. So last semester I did a video about two-thirds of the way in where they were already writing their close reading papers and they wanted some guidance about how to do that. This is more about the pre-writing process. Because you guys, nobody started writing their close reading paper yet, have you? Good. Um, we don't want you to at this point. We want you to, to, to be thinking about it. You, if you have a topic, hopefully you're doing some of the pre-writing stuff already. You're going to realize that whatever text you pick, you're already doing this process a little bit. Um, so that's the, that's the purpose of this workshop. The other thing is, there's another purpose, which is that if I'm teaching an introduction to philosophy class, or really any philosophy class, 
one of the things that I would like you to, to take forth from this, whether you're going to be a philosophy major, uh, any of you considering philosophy major at this point? No? Uh, that's okay. Um, there's plenty of other things to, to study. But one of the things I'd like you to actually know about is what we do in philosophy. What's distinctive about our craft? Not just, you know, who do we study, but how do we approach things in a distinct way that's, you know, related to but different from what you did in, in literature class or history class. So I'm having you guys actually practice the craft of philosophy at, a, you know, sort of a, a beginner level, beginner to intermediate level, um, by doing these close readings. You're doing what it is that we do when we write at least some of us, when we write articles, or we write books, or we prepare a lecture to teach in class. When I'm teaching you things, it's usually the product of having done close reading of, say, Plato's text. So, um, let's talk about what a close reading actually is. Those of you who had it in, in uh, literature classes or history classes, what was it like? What did you have to do in those classes for a close reading? Do you remember? Or? Yeah, um, it was normally you'd have like the text you're reading, the book, or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you just basically you could pick like themes if you wanted to, or you could pick discussions, and then you just break it down and write about the main idea, or the main um, I guess argument for that specific part, or you would write about like an overall concept, comparing and contrasting two different ideas within the book. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a good basic structure to close reading. Um, did you have to quote from the text in order yeah. to do it? Yeah. You didn't have to, but in order to, I guess, prove your argument, you had to. So. Yeah. It's called a close reading because you're remaining close to the text. If I had a book, I'd like hold it up in front of my face and here's, here's where you ought to be. Um, you can bring in your own ideas, your own approach to it, but it's supposed to be rooted in the text and usually the thinker, because usually a text is by one thinker, who you're, you're reading. You're trying to ultimately demonstrate to somebody else that you understand what's going on in at least one portion of that text, that you can talk intelligently about it. Which means that you know if you actually want to be able to do that, you have to understand something about it, right? You can't just uh, copy from Spark Notes or, or you know, Wikipedia or things like that, because you're probably not going to successfully convey understanding. You'll convey somebody else's understanding, but that may not be you know, very helpful for, for the paper that you're writing. Um, now, I've got this sort of diagram up here, and I think it's helpful for you to think of close reading as what we call, <coughs> there's a fancy word, iter I might be misspelling it, uh, iterative, meaning You're going back and forth. You're doing the same thing multiple times. And when you're iterating something, you're taking the product from the last time that you did that operation, and you're using that as the input. So think about relationships. Relationships are iterative. Um, how many of you have had boyfriends or girlfriends, uh, either have one now or had one in the past? Okay, so all of you are familiar with fights, right? Or did you have a perfect relationship, no fights whatsoever? Now, you remember the first fight? It was terrible. Oh, I can't believe we're fighting. You know, the whole world falls apart. And then, you know, now remember, like, the if you can, the third or the fifth fight in, and sooner or later somebody's going to refer back to that first fight mm -hmm. and how things were before that. They're using the past of the same thing to talk about that same thing. That's iterative in a, in a somewhat different way than, than a close reading. With a close reading, what you're doing is you're spending some time reading. And notice I put rereading here. Any text that you're going to get to the bottom of, you're going to have to read multiple times. So you're reading it, then you're doing some writing. But that's not the end. Now you go back to it and you read it some more. And you do some more writing. And you read it some more. And you go back and forth like that. That's the way in which you actually acquire a deeper understanding of, of complex texts, whether they're in philosophy, whether they're a Shakespeare play, whether they're um, you know, Suetonius's 
history of the Caesars. You're, you're always going to have to go back and forth. You're going to have to do some sort of product on your end, on your own behalf, to pin things down. But that shouldn't be your, your absolutely final product. This isn't the kind of paper where you know, you've read everything and now you sit down on a Sunday night and just crank it out. You want to do some of the writing early on and do more of it and more of it and more of it and build on that. Now what has to happen in between, do you think? You read stuff, you write. What's the, the glue? Yeah. Thought processing. Exactly. You've got to think about this stuff. That's, that's part of why I have you write these reflection papers, these short journal entries. You're reflecting on something in the text. You're tying it together with your own life. You're trying to make sense out of it. You know, oftentimes these texts are two millennia old, and you say, what, what the hell do they have to do with me? You know, I'm a college student in the third millennium. Um, what does that got to do with my condition? Well, you, you figure that out. And when you have something in the text that actually does captivate you, and I think the text that we looked at, you can find something at least that you find interesting or puzzling or even fascinating. You, you keep working at it, right? You read some more, you think about it, you write a little bit. You think about what you wrote. Is this actually right? What else could I say about this? Then, you know, you, you stop. Stop writing and you go back to the text and read it again. And you say, oh, wait a second, I missed this connection here. Now you've got something else to think about, something else to write about. That's the process of, of close reading. Um, now, for philosophy, like I said, it's mostly about concepts, how the concepts are connected to each other in explanations, in making distinctions. All those things that we called earlier on the elements of philosophy. Argument is going to be particularly important for that. Um, so, now what is close reading not going to be? There's a couple other genres of writing that you guys have done and you're more familiar with that you don't want to mix this up with. And I see people do this from time to time. So first off, how many of you had to write the five paragraph essay? Is that still like the standard curriculum? Okay, throw all that crap away. You don't have to write any five paragraph essays. You can have as many paragraphs as you like. You do have to write in paragraphs. Don't, don't give me one continuous flow of text. Uh, you do have to write in paragraphs because that's how we organize thought. But there, there's no, there's no reason whatsoever that you would have five paragraphs and the first paragraph would be this way and the, the you know, fifth one would be this way. Um, what other things do you think, just having get, you know, ha had this sort of thumbnail sketch, what else doesn't this sound like that you've done before? What other kinds of writings have you had to do? Yeah. Research papers. Yeah, this is not a research paper. Now, if you were to go on further in philosophy and you wanted to say write journal articles, you would combine um, close reading with doing you know, some of the stuff you do in a research paper, and you would probably take into account what other people have to say if you're writing on Plato, what other people have to say about Plato and that text and the arguments and the characters. But for the purposes of what we're doing here, you don't actually need anything other than the text itself. Um, so yeah, it's not a research paper. What else doesn't this sound like that you've, that you've written before? What other kinds of things have you? It's not a book report either, right? What, what's a book report like? Summary. You have to summarize the whole thing, right? So imagine summarizing the symposium. Start at the start. These are the characters. Go through each speech. Is, is that going to be very helpful for this sort of thing? No, that, it would totally lack focus, wouldn't it? You want to find something that you can do this back and forth thing on. You don't actually need to go back and forth to do a summary. You're going to sit down the first time and do a summary. Um, what else? It's not just a compare and contrast paper. It can have the element of compare and contrast in it, but it's not just a, well, here's what Plato says here with 
Eric Simicus, and here's what he says with Agathon, and here's how they're similar, and here's how they're different. Why not? You want to be able to say why the differences matter. And that's where a compare contrast paper often ends. It doesn't go into that, right? You're, it's enough to just say, here's how they're the same, here's how they're different. Um, with a close reading, you want to think about the significance of what it is that you're, you're talking about. So you do want to focus in on key passages. That's probably something that you haven't done an awful lot of in other papers that you've written so far. Um, you also want to figure out, you want to be very careful to distinguish the author's position from other positions that come up in it. So, you know, when Plato has Ereximachus talking, does that mean that Plato is endorsing Ereximachus's views? Not necessarily, right? I mean, who, who's your best bet to figure with a Plato dialogue? Yeah. Socrates? Probably Socrates, yeah. There are a few later dialogues where Socrates is a young guy and somebody else is doing the talking. And there's actually a few where the, the, the interlocutors might you know, make some really good points. But for the most part, yeah, Socrates is Plato's mouthpiece. So you should probably go there. But you notice, like in the symposium, Socrates himself didn't do his own talking. He like puts it in the mouth of Diodema to, to say these, these things. So, um, you know, you want to be careful with that sort of thing. And, and that will come if you're doing this process of going back and forth, you know. Sometimes it takes actually putting things down on paper, and the, the writing doesn't necessarily mean writing your paper. It could be doing outlining. It could be figuring out who's actually saying what, getting straight about that uh, in your mind. So these are all elements of, of close reading. Let's look now at what the goals of doing a close reading actually are. So we can think about this in two different ways. One is by, by like, you know, going to the assignment sheet and looking at the basic format requirements. And this is, um, you know, this is sort of peculiar to me, I guess you could say. But this is, you know, good order for an academic paper. Um, the basic requirements, you have to have a title page. Why do you have a title page? Because I don't care what your title is. You have to have a title page because the title page doesn't matter at all. You can put unicorns or you know, explosions on it, you know, anything you like. I, I, don't, I don't really care. You know, I, I might look at it if you do something really interesting, put an animated GIF or something like that. But I don't take points off and I don't add points in for that. The reason why I have you do a title page is so you don't put any of the, the, the garbage that you would normally put in a title page into the body of the paper. Because I'm going to read the body of the paper. Um, the main body of the paper should be at least three full pages for these kinds of assignments. Full pages being, you know, begins at the top, goes all the way to the bottom, one inch margins all around. Um, now why do I have that, that length requirement? Well, because, you know, for the finished product, you know, when you're doing your notes, if it's one and a half pages, because that's all you could come up with at that point in time, that, that's fine. But as you do more thinking, you'll do more writing. As you're spending more time with the text, you'll end up doing more writing. And three pages is really the bare minimum for being able to do any kind of assignment like this um, for this, this kind of class. Probably you're going to write more. You know, you, you don't want to just write to the, to the bare minimum. You want to explore the topic uh, to the degree that it, it needs it. Don't write like a 20-page magnum opus, because that, it's not that kind of paper, um, unless you're like super gifted with writing. But I don't want you to take away from all your other classes. Um, a works cited page, if you want to bring in other sources, which I do not recommend for these very beginning level papers, um, because I want you to be doing your own thinking putting things in your own terms. Then you have to have a works cited page. Do, you know, what, what type of um, references do you have to put in? Um, I don't care. MLA, uh, APA, Chicago Manual Style, Turabian if any of you are history majors. Um, they're all fine. You don't need to bring in any secondary sources in order to do this well. But if you want to, then you probably should document according to some, some style. 
but I'm not going to be particularly concerned about that. Um, as far as the documentation for stuff that you're taking from the text, here's all you need to do. You took a quote from page 26 of the uh, text that I produced for you. Page 26, and you're done. That's all you need. Um, what else? If you're quoting or paraphrasing, you do want to document. Spell checking and grammar checking, you have, for the finished product for these, you must spell check it. And have somebody else proofread it, take, take a look at it. Um, that's all like basic nuts and bolts stuff. What do you really need to do in a close reading? What's the real goals here? The fundamental goal for any paper that you're writing for me in a philosophy class is for you to demonstrate to me that you actually have worked out some fairly sophisticated thinking about the texts, <coughs> the thinkers, the concepts that we're, we're working with. I'm not expecting you to be at some stellar level. I'm expecting you to be at the beginner to intermediate level. Right? But that doesn't mean just, you know, totally raw, undigested thoughts. That means that you've actually tried to work, work at this um, quite a bit, using this, this iterative process. So like I put here in the assignment sheet, primary goal is to show me that you've attentively read, studied, and reflected on the portion of the text that you're studying. Notice it's a portion. Do I expect any of you, if you're going to write on the symposium, to fully understand the symposium inside and out? That would be crazy, wouldn't it? I mean, think about all those speeches. Can you keep them all straight in your head at this point in time? I can, because I've been teaching this for like 10 years, but can you? You don't need to. What I, what I want you to do is focus in on some portion of the text that you find particularly interesting, that you think is important, and be able to communicate about it. So, like I put here, you're going to do this by selecting a central idea or claim or argument, problem or passage, explaining it as fully and comprehensively as possible. There's no single way of doing this. Um, you can explain the relationships between the, what you're discussing and other key ideas. You can provide good examples. Um, the entire time, though, and here's part of what goes to this goal, you're expected to remain close to the text. So, you know, you can bring in your own personal opinions. You can bring in your own perspective. But I want what you're doing to be responding to and thinking about how the text might be able to respond to you. If you're going to make an objection, Plato got something totally wrong, you should look within the text. And that, this is part of that process. When you think Plato's got something wrong, go back to the text and read it. See whether he addresses that somewhere else. And if he does, you've already got some of your writing done. You, know, you can say, at first, somebody might think this is the case. But then when you look at this passage over here, it turns out, no, Plato actually foresaw the reader talking about that and managed to address it. That's the sort of thing that you would actually write down. That shows the process of thought. It's sort of like, remember in math classes showing your work? They still make you do that? Yeah? Drove me nuts. Because I'm one of these people that back then, I could carry out a lot of things in my head, so I'd skip steps. And, but I was also kind of sloppy, so sometimes I'd make mistakes. And then, you know, since I hadn't shown my work, I'd not only get the wrong answer, but I wouldn't get the partial credit for showing your work. In philosophy, you want to show your work, um, not to get partial credit or anything like that, but because that, that's what we actually want, is the work. Not just the end product, but the, the work, the, the thought processes. Um, yeah, that's, that's probably enough about, about that. Any questions so far? And everything is fair game, by the way. Um, what font and what size do you want? Uh, like 12 point font. Okay. Um, Times New Roman, I, I like, because uh, it's pretty standard. Um, I don't usually like, you know, I'm not like a font Nazi or anything like that. But, um, you know, sometimes people try to use weird fonts to fill up the page. With these sort of, uh, these sort of essays, you don't want to try to write to, to length. You just want to write as much as you need to for it. What other questions or confusions or 
issues at this point. We talked about goals, we talked a bit about the assignment sheet, what a close reading is, what a close reading isn't. Is it all clear? Is there anything that's confusing? Do you feel equipped at this point to be able to move into doing close readings? How many of you, by show of hands, how many of you feel fairly confident about doing these close readings at this point? Okay. So this is a good point, actually, to sort of pause and think about the, the pre-writing exercise that you did. Um, I had you first think about a passage, because all, all you guys have studied so far is Plato, right? Think about a passage that, or, or, or a concept of, of love or friendship that you can remember. How many of you were able to write something down? Everybody? Okay. Now, what about those other three things that I'm asking about? How would those, if you were to follow through on, on those, how would those help you with this process of thinking, writing, rereading? You've got a model, right? Are you able to think at this point about passages that have something to do with, maybe support or go against the, the idea of love or friendship that you're working with? By show of hands, how many of you on the spot could at least come up with one passage that you remember from the text? Okay, so maybe, maybe about a third of the class. So what would you do? You'd, you'd actually have to, most of the people, and even those who can remember something, you want to make sure you've actually remembered it, right? You've got to go back to the text. You've read it through. We've had a class session on it. But now you're going to do some writing on it. So now you've got to go back and see what you can bring out of the text that's relevant. And when you go back, you're going to find other passages, too, that turn out to be relevant as you're reading around. Um, what else? How, how did you guys find... Did anyone start on the other uh, bits of the, the assignment? Would doing that sort of thing help you with this kind of reading and writing process, you think? That, that's not the only way to do it. We could come up with all sorts of other interesting templates. That's a template, basically, um, or an exercise. But there's all sorts of ways in which you can do this. The basic idea is you're going back and forth, you're going back and forth. And you're trying to you know, come up with things that you can use, you're trying to put together kind of a, a treasure chest of quotations, of things that you figured out, of figuring out why you yourself are interested in this. Um, that's probably something important, too. How many of you found something, just anything, in the Plato selections that we've read so far that you found yourself responding to either positively or negatively, saying, wow, this, this is really good, Plato's right about this, or... This guy is totally wrong about this. How many of you by show of hands? Okay, so a good, good portion. Um, now, do you know why you responded to that that way? How many of you would say you've got a good, solid idea of why you responded to it that way? A few. Okay. Um, that's worth thinking about. If you responded to it that way, you think you're the only person in the world who, who would? There's probably great scholars out there who, when they read that passage, said, there's something fishy about this, for those who you know, looked at it negatively, or, wow, things fall into place if I look at things this way. You're, you're not alone in that. And it's worth thinking about why this actually matters to you. That will be, that's something worth writing down. That's something worth bringing to the text next time that you read through it. That's also some self-knowledge that you're carrying with you. So let's look now, um, going back from you know, sort of the ideal down to the nuts and bolts stuff, let's look at the grading rubric. I, I give you this, this grading rubric, and any good writing assignment um, should have a rubric. It should have some sort of way by which you can figure out how you're going to be scored. Um, I, I highly encourage you, although you may tick some of your teachers off, to always ask for rubrics when there's an assignment. Because they help you to understand what I'm looking for, what, what you're 
instructor is looking for. And you notice I have um, a bunch of different categories here. So framing the general issue. What am I looking for you to do? If you look at the excellent category, it's clear what issue is being studied and discussed by the students. Um, so I want you to tell me, what are you actually talking about? Um, do you have to do that in the entire first paragraph? Of course not. You know, you could do it probably in a sentence. Do you need a thesis statement? No, you don't need a thesis statement. You just have to tell me what it is that you're actually going to be looking at, right? Um, notes, connections, or implications of, the, of this issue with other issues. That's, that's at a very high level. That's the excellent category. I want you to tell me why this is important by showing me how it's connected with other issues. Um, understanding of main concepts. That's really core. I need you to demonstrate to me that you actually understand what you're, what you're talking about. Um, I, I would encourage you actually to pair up with um, classmates and bounce your ideas off of them. Um, understanding of the author's position. This is where I, I, I mentioned it's important to be able to distinguish between what Plato is endorsing and what Plato is saying, somebody might say this, but I don't think this, or between the different characters, don't mix up, say, Agathon and Pausanias, they're not the same, same guy. Um, when we get to other texts that aren't dialogues, how might this come into play? Aristotle, for example, will present many other people's positions, and then he will criticize their positions and say, I think this is good and I think this is bad. You don't want to mix up, say, Empedocles' position on love or desire with Aristotle's own position. See how that's, that's important? Uh, interpretation of the author's text. Now, when we say interpretation, what does that bring to mind for you? If I say interpret, yeah. How you perceive it? Yeah, okay, so there, that's part of it, how you, the writer, the person who's actually reading it, thinking about it, writing it, how you perceive it. Um, is your interpretation going to be the same as mine, necessarily? It better be, right, because it's my class. No, I'm not there. <laughs> You've had teachers like that, I think. I had a guy, when I was in middle school, who would actually, class sessions consisted in, in him telling us, open the book to page such and such, at this word, begin underlining, and then stop at this word, um, and that was the entire class session, just underlining the things that he thought were important in the book. No discussion of it whatsoever, no questions, and if you, you know, if you didn't underline the stuff, he would actually collect your books and see whether you would underline properly uh, to, you know, so that your interpretation was exactly the same as, as his. He, he, oh, that's right. He also told us, put a note on the side. Write this in the margin. Do any of you write in books? Yeah. That doesn't work for philosophy. It, it's, it's important that you actually yourself come to some sort of interpretation that you can think to be reasonable about the text and about what's going on in the text. Um, now that said, you, some interpretations are better than others. What makes an interpretation better than another interpretation? Like if I say Moby Dick, any of you read Moby Dick in, in high school? It's, it's you know, a long book, isn't it? Tedious in a lot of parts. What are some books that you actually did read? If you read Moby Dick, something most people probably read. Fight Club. Did you read Fight Club? Really? Yeah. Wow. You guys had a lot cooler high school than, than we did. Um, I read Fight Club. That was a pretty good book. Now, my interpretation of Fight Club is that it's really about the capitalist system and what it does to us as human beings and how we need to break out of it. Does that sound like a, a reasonable, if you haven't read the book, you've seen the movie probably, right? Does that seem like a reasonable interpretation of Fight Club? Or alternately, my interpretation of Fight Club is it's all about uh, young male angst in the modern age and how people just do things that are violent and seemingly irrational so that they feel like they're alive. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah? Okay. 
Um, my interpretation of Fight Club, this is the third interpretation, is about hot dogs. Really, we all ought to be eating more hot dogs. That's the core message of the book. And every time, what was the Edward Norton's character name? Does anyone remember offhand? I think he didn't have it. He didn't? No, no. He was in there. Oh, Edward Norton's character. Yeah. He didn't have a name at all? Mm -hmm. yeah, they don't just mention his yeah. name. Okay. Well, the very namelessness of him somehow refers to hot dogs. And um, it's probably a sign that we need to put more confidence <coughs> on hot dogs. Really? The ideal hot dog is the Chicago hot dog because it has a, an entire array of confidence. Now, is that a reasonable interpretation? No. No? Why not? What are, what are the flaws with that interpretation? <coughs> there are many, right? I thought it was pretty concrete. <laughs> yes, that's one, of, that's one of the few good points about it. It's very concrete based on images. Everyone's imagining a Chicago hot dog. Um, what are some of the problems with that? Yeah. No factual evidence to back it up or like really any reasoning behind it? Yeah. Well, what reasoning there is is crazy reasoning, right? All about hot dogs and the important. You can tell whoever came up with that interpretation, hot dogs are very important for them. Yeah, and they probably would do that in other cases. But yeah, there isn't any, um, there's nothing that it's really based on that you can point to in the text. Maybe they ate a hot dog at one point in the text, I don't remember. You know, and then this person would seize on it. See, there's, there's the point that, sh that, that proves my, my, my thesis. Well, no, it's crazy. And, and so there are better and there are worse interpretations. What makes an interpretation good is not just that it's reasonable, but that it's relevant. You want it to be relevant to the text. So, you know, with Moby Dick, if somehow you make it about landfills, probably that's not going to work. There better be a w discussion of a whale in there somewhere, right? Because that's really what it's about. Ad nauseum, all these descriptions about the whaling industry and things like that. Um, so it has to be relevant, it has to be reasonable, and it also needs to be based, like you were saying, on facts. What would be the facts for us with a, a close reading? It's not like we're going to you know, look at you know, the world out there. The facts are going to be found, what we're going to call facts here. It's a very loose and slippery term, facts. They're going to be found in the text. So if you're saying that Plato is saying X, Y, Z, you should be able to find some passage where he's saying something reasonably close to that, right? And then you should be able to explain to me why we should interpret that passage as referring to that. If Fight Club is really about capitalism, then you're going to have to do some work, right? But there are passages in the text that support that reading. If it's really about adolescent angst and you know angry young men, I think that's an easier uh, interpretation of support because just about every page has something you could you could point to. But you notice that what you're doing there is you're you're giving an argument, you're giving a set of connected reasons why somebody should accept your your interpretation. Um, so that's, that's very important. Quotations are paraphrases from the text. I've got some criteria for that. You want to make sure that they're the relevant ones. Don't just pick out quotes at random. Organizing your paper, um, that's important. And then other writing mechanics. But I don't need to talk that much about, about that. Um, any, any questions at this point? Before we go into some more conceptual stuff. Any worries? Okay. So let's ask a sort of deeper question. Why should you reread texts at all? Yeah? Because most of the time when you only read something once, you miss a lot of points. And you like, aren't really that clear. Like, the first time you read something, you're just kind of reading the words. The next time, the words fit together. Yeah. Now, why does that matter? Like, you yeah. Why does that matter? Why do you need to understand what you're reading? I mean, you can say, well, because you're going to take an exam at the end of the semester. Why well, would you want to read something unless you already understand it? Okay. That's, that's, now we're starting to get to deeper levels of, of motivation, of, of value, right? Why bother reading Plato if you're not going to understand it? Just to get through a class? None of the class is a waste of your time, really. Um, and, and Plato isn't a waste of time. We know this because lots of people throughout all history 
have gotten something out of reading the guy. And, you know, one, when you're an old person, there will be young people that are being introduced to Plato for the first time. And suddenly the whole world opening up for them. That's, that's the power that these sort of texts have. Um, so you want to think about what you want to get out of these texts. Close reading, the reason why I have you do close reading is because this is one of the tried and true techniques that we have for doing that sort of thing. Think of yourself as sort of like a miner or you know, a spelunker, you know, probing around in caves looking for treasures. Um, this is sort of a, a set of tools and a map. Um, there are some strategies that you can, you can use when you're rereading philosophical texts. Like the, the, as you're saying, the first time that you read a text, you're reading it just to sort of like get through it and see what the hell's going on here, right? What's he talking about? And you miss most of what's going on, right? I, I still do, even when I'm reading philosophical texts. Even armed with all the background knowledge, I have to go over them several times if I want to actually have the, you know, the chance to get much out of them. Um, you want to ask yourself, what is the author, as you're going through rereading, what is the author actually trying to do? What's, what are they trying to convey to me? Sometimes that won't be on the surface. <coughs> You know, for example, let, let's, let's use this. Socrates made some bad arguments, didn't he, from time to time in, in the Lysis? Places where you could have said, well, wait a second. Now, that doesn't hold up. Why did Plato do that? Shouldn't Socrates have been, you know, like super smart and never make a mistake? Why would Plato deliberately introduce bad arguments in the mouth of the guy who's supposed to be speaking for him. Maybe Plato's a dummy. Maybe Plato didn't realize they were bad arguments. What do you think? Yeah? He put in the bad, bad arguments so other people could understand why they were bad arguments. Like instead of just saying this is the way things are, you put in things that people themselves would think about and then explain why it's not necessarily the best. Yeah. That's, that's, a, a, that's a good way to articulate it. Um, they're sort of like exercises, or as, as they call them these days in a variety of contexts, Easter eggs, right? You guys are familiar with this term? An Easter egg in a game is like some little thing you find over here. Those are, those are Plato's Easter eggs. Um, so you want to think about that sort of thing. You want to try to take notes. Part of the writing process is actually taking notes. You want to take notes on the content, on the form, on the context, on what's going on. Do your notes have to be perfect? No, they're, they're just for you. You're not gonna like, you know, pass them on to posterity. Um, they just have to get you through the, the process and they can be focused on what you're interested in. Um, try to, as you're rereading it, try to connect it to your own life experience, your own situation. I think with this stuff on love and friendship, that's pretty easy to do, isn't it? Um, maybe if we were reading, you know, straight up metaphysics, that might not be quite so easy, you know, being itself. That's harder to connect to your own life. Um, but all of you, you know, experience love and friendship, so you can, you can relate to that. Um, you also want to work out themes that, that interest you. This is part of why I had you do that, that pre-writing exercise, what bit of it that I, I had you do. Um, what are you interested in when it comes to these two texts that we've read so far, the Lysis and the Symposium? What did you find that if somebody asked you about it, you would like to talk, you would like to tell them about it? Anything? Like, like to quote from it? Well, you could quote from it or you could just, you know, you could say, this guy said this stuff and I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Well, I was talking about like um, it'll list the different definitions of friendship and in the symposium, the different definitions of love. Okay. A lot of, I think probably a lot of other people found that interesting too, right? That the fact that there can be different understandings of these things. Did any of the, the understandings of friendship or love particularly <coughs> speak to you as relevant to the kind of things you've experienced? Anything click? as you were reading it. Those would be things you could write about in a close reading paper. 
you know? Things that matter to you. Did any, was there anything in these texts where you found yourself saying, Plato is just a dummy? If you did, that's okay. Um, when I first read Aristotle, for years, I thought Aristotle was a dummy. I couldn't stand reading him. I was like, this, this stuff is just common sense. You know, the parts of it that make sense are just common sense, and the other parts are just incomprehensible. <coughs> it was only after I actually started reading him in Greek that it made sense to me. And I was like, wow, I was, I was actually the dummy uh, in, in <coughs> castigating Aristotle for this. He's actually pretty brilliant. Um, but you could start from that kind of starting point. That could be a theme. I think Plato is wrong about this, or this is a dangerous idea, or people shouldn't be talking this way. That's probably not where you want to finish, but that's a good place to start for this process of going back and forth. You think Plato you know, is, is wrong about something? Read, read some more Plato. See if Plato has a response to give you. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. That's a, a valid theme. Um, think about the deeper versus the surface meanings. Like, let's say we take Aristophanes' speech. At first, Aristophanes' speech is about what? These crazy human beings and what the gods do to them and, you know, mating and, like, you know, um, mixing together and, and <laughs> sewing people shut and, you know, all sorts of goofy things like that. What's it really about? What's the deeper meaning? It's about love, but what, what about love? What did you remember? We're always searching for our other half. Mm -hmm. And when we find them, we want to, you know, we want to like hug them and have sex with them. But is that what we really, really want? We really want to be whole again. We want to be. We want this unattainable goal for us. Very romantic, isn't it? It leaves a gaping hole in us that we're trying to find the show. Yeah. That's the deeper, deeper meaning of the allegory that he's he's telling. Um, you could say, you know, what's the deeper meaning of, of Agathon's speech? Agathon doesn't actually know what he's talking about, but he's great at talking, isn't he? Um, you know, you could think about these sorts of <coughs> things. Um, another thing I would say is important is try to get past the I totally agree, I totally disagree kind of orientation. That's okay to start from, you know. Plato's completely right, Plato's completely wrong, or you know, one of the characters, Socrates is completely right in this point. This is something that you guys have started doing in your journal assignments, saying, well, I, I agree with so-and-so to this extent, but here's where I disagree. That's the kind of stuff I, I love to see. Why, why do I like to see that kind of stuff, making distinctions like that? Yeah. Because it shows your understanding of it, but it also shows that you have different thoughts about the context. Yeah, it shows that you're not just like blindly grabbing onto something. You're able to coherently pick out what's good and what's bad. And then you know, going further is being able to say, here's why this is good, here's why this is bad. That's, that's particularly important for philosophy. Um, Let's talk now about organization. So how should you organize your paper? Do you think there's a recipe for this? One single way that you ought to do this? I said not the five paragraph essay. Maybe you have to write the six paragraph essay, Dr. Sadler style. Nah, there isn't anything like that. These close reading papers, they can be done in a lot of different ways. Um, I think at this point in time, you've all done quite a bit of writing in your previous classes. Um, do you use organizational techniques? Do you find those helpful? What kind of things do you use, those of you who do use organizational techniques, when you're, when you're pre-writing, when you're getting ready to write your, your paper? What do you do? Any of you take, make, make an outline? How many of you find doing that helpful? OK, so quite a few. Is it, is it helpful for everyone? <coughs> Are there other techniques that might be more useful for you? I never ended up being able to stick to an outline. I always end up like deviating from it myself. It shows that outlines aren't that good for me. Then have you ever like make note cards and you put them on the table so that you can, you know, like 
you've got this passage and this passage, and you're going to figure out which, which should come first and which should come after that. If you have them on note cards, you can move them around on the table. Or, you know, there's software you can use, like Mind Map. Any of you guys ever use that sort of stuff? Um, you, can, you can put them, you know, move them around, you know, sketch out the relations that they have to each other. I actually have a chalkboard at home that I use when I'm trying to figure things out. Um, I'll write stuff up on the chalkboard and make diagrams for myself. You can do that sort of thing as part of your pre-writing. Some of you are going to be much more spatially oriented. Charts, maps help you out. Some of you are more textually oriented. If making some sort of chart helps you figure out how to write your paper so that it actually holds together and makes sense, by all means do that. Use every technique you can possibly find that will help you out with that. Um, don't worry. Here's another thing. Don't worry about starting your paper with a hook. You guys remember that advice? The opposite advice from papers, got to get the audience interested. <coughs> yeah? So you're going to write about global warming. Hurricane Sandy may have been caused by global warming. Many people were put out you know, by it, and the damage is, is you know, not going to be undone in certain areas of New York. Some historic monuments are lost. And then you just start talking about global warming itself, right? Um, now, if you do that for a Chicago audience, maybe they're not so interested compared to an audience from around here. Um, or, you know, have you seen the Stronger Than the Storm advertisements? What is that really about? You know, that could be about global warming and Hurricane Sandy, too. You don't need anything like that for these kind of papers. Why, why not? I'll give you one reason, then, then I want you to think about the, the, another reason. I'm already interested in what you have to say. So you don't need to hook me in with an introductory paragraph that, you know, tells me about Socrates and his history or anything like that. Um, Plato was a philosopher in, in ancient Greece who lived from such and such a time. I, I, don't, I don't care. I already know all of that. I want to see you guys engaging with the text. Practicing the craft of, of philosophy. Why else don't you need that sort of glitzy introductory paragraph? Uh, we're not all writing about the same thing. It's not like one focus that we all need, like a captivating kind of way to get attention when what we're writing about is like coming from our own like personal interest. That's an interesting observation. I hadn't thought of that one, actually. But yeah, you're right. Um, you, some of you are going to write papers on the same themes, but you're not going to write the same paper. You're going to write probably very different papers. Um, the other thing is I want you to write about things that are intrinsically interesting, things that you are actually interested in and other people are interested in. And since the theme is love and friendship, are people generally interested in that sort of stuff? Yeah, we, you know, whole sections in bookstores about that. Um, writing about that sort of thing, you're not going to need any hook to bring people in. Um, the other thing I want to say when it comes to organizing your thought and work is think about the logical order of your paper. You, the things that you're writing, the paragraphs, each paragraph should you know, have some sort of complete thought expressed in it to completely work out with it. Um, there should be a, a, a necessary order to them. It shouldn't be possible to take your paragraphs and just sort of jumble them all up and the paper makes just as much sense. You should be going from point A to at least point B, if not you know, point Z, by the, you know, from the beginning to the end of the paper. There should be some sort of um, going from the simpler, the more crude to the more sophisticated, the more complex from the surface to the, to the deeper, from, say, a situation where Plato doesn't make any sense to a situation where what he's saying does make sense. You think of your paper as sort of demonstrating that you can move from point A to, to point B. 
Um, there should be some sort of logical structure to that. And that's, again, why outlining could be helpful or you know, these other techniques, because they show you that logical structure. Um, I had this, this handout on seven strategies, but I'm not going to go over that because um, we're actually getting close to running out of time, and I want to have time for questions, concerns, confusions, all that sort of stuff. So the last thing that I want to say before we do that is about using outside resources. So I have nothing against you using Wikipedia or other sites for background knowledge, for you know filling you in about things, going to encyclopedias. As a matter of fact, I, I provide you sometimes with links to online encyclopedias of, of philosophy. I don't want that to become a substitute for your own process of, of coming to know the text through reading and thinking and writing. So you shouldn't be incorporating stuff from, say, Wikipedia into, um, into your papers. Every one of you is smart enough to be able to take some topic and wrestle with it on your own to come up with passages within the text that are relevant to that and to put it together in some sort of coherent whole if you give yourself enough time. If you don't start working on it the day before it's due, but start working on it now with these kind of baby step things and then it, it just grows and grows and grows. Every one of you is smart enough to do that. Every one of you is able to you know, dig into Plato or, or later Aristotle, Augustine, these other thinkers, and make sense out of them and say something interesting to me about it. So you can, again, I'm not saying don't ever look at Wikipedia, just um, try to understand that that's just for background knowledge. It's not a research tool. It's The research tool for this is the text going back to that text over and over and over again. Um, also, I, you know, I give you handouts and I give you these iLearn lessons. I don't want you quoting my iLearn lessons in this sort of stuff, because I know what I said about it. I want to see you engaging Plato, right? Um, in your own words, with your own thoughts. I already know what I think about it. I don't need to hear that stuff. And I'm not, you know, I'm not an authority. Uh, on, on Plato the way, you know, somebody who's published books on Plato is. I'm just, you know, some, some guy who teaches this stuff. So, now, any, any questions, concerns, confusions, <laughs> anything is fair game. Everybody feel completely confident about this? Anybody who doesn't feel confident? Everything's totally clear? That's kind of hard to believe. Until I start like writing it and then I'll be like, wait. Hey, yeah. Questions. Yeah, you know, that, that, so that's a good point. Um, when you're engaged in this process of writing, you may run into points where you, you're saying, man, I'm not sure if I'm on the right track here. So I would say three things sort of guideposts or lighthouses to keep in mind. One is, um, is the stuff that you're writing actually interesting to you? Do you have a topic, ooh, do you have a topic that you're, you know, you're sticking with that, that you actually find interesting, that somebody else would find interesting? Two, are you, um, are you citing relevant passages? Are you, are you making sure that the stuff that you're bringing in from the text is actually relevant to the point? Or are you just sort of, you know, trying to get it done, juggling things up? And then third, try to always say why. You know, like with the distinction, I, I like this part, I don't like this part. I like this part because X, Y, Z. I don't like this part because that saying why, that's the basic structure of argument. And, and that's one of the key elements of philosophy. So uh, if you start to get lost when you're in the process of writing it, try to like navigate by those three lighthouses and that might, might help you out a bit.